but apparently uh, he was one of the few voices of reason at this time in the government. Well, anyway, they commissioned this project, and it was Operation High Jumped. Admiral Byrd was taking um, a small contingent of men. Actually, he was taking 4,000 men. Uh, he was going down there for an eight-month mission. Um, he had an aircraft carrier, battleships, uh, armed submarines, uh, and then 20 supplying battleships. So, and he's going on what was ostensibly called a mapping mission. Um, myself and everybody else questions that that was uh, what it was about. Well, Admiral Byrd went down there and his eight-month mission was over in about a week. They were back in eight weeks. Um, and according to uh, Admiral Byrd, after he, he made a public statement in, from Argentina on his way back, and he said something to the effect that the Third World War would be fought with an enemy that could fly, with an adversary that could fly unrestricted from pole to pole. So he was hinting at energy source, he's hinting at uh, the capabilities that he ran into or that he was imagining. But now, you know, as time passes, things come out. And his secret diary, and some of the things that he says in his secret diary are now public. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow Stephen Sardoni, now he's a researcher that apparently has delved deeply into this and has gotten a hold of Admiral Byrd's private diary on the subject on this trip. Let me uh, let Stephen recount the items in his diary. I will now read excerpts from Admiral Richard B. Byrd's diary dated February and March of 1947. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny but I must do my duty and record here for all to read one day. In a world of greed and exploitation of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is true. Flight log, base camp, Arctic, February 19th, 1947, 0600 hours. All preparations are complete for our flight northward and we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 0610 hours. It is, in fact, too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etchings of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world, I half gasp under my breath. Yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariane, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. 
Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted. But what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return. For there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugorads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answered. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master. The Dark Ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. But I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race. Perhaps by then you will have learned the futility of war and its strife, and after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With these closing words, our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility. I do not know which. Suddenly, I was again aware that the two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, motioned one. I turned once more before leaving and looked back toward the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke. Then he gestured with a lovely, slender hand, a motion of peace, and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly we walked back toward the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward and we were at once going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with this message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief, and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It's all right, Howie. It is all right. The two beings motioned us towards the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance guiding us on our return way. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. 215 hours, a radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Avita Shen. We watched for a moment as the Flugorads disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft suddenly felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thoughts. 2200 hours. We were again over vast areas, ice and snow, and approximately 27 minutes from base camp. 
We radio then, they respond. We report all conditions normal. Normal. Base camp expresses relief at our reestablished contact. Log entry 300 hours. We land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. March 11, 1947. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of this United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. Number 1956, final entry. These last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I now make my final entry in this singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept this matter secret as directed all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. Now I seem to sense the long night coming on, and this secret will not die with me. But as all true shall, it shall triumph, and so it shall. Thank you, Stephen, for your research and your and your reading of that diary item, it blew my mind when I first heard it. Mine yeah. too. Yeah. In fact, I couldn't help thinking of the the uh, race of beings Go that on. Lytton described, the Virilians. It sounded so much like Admiral Byrd's description. I mean, maybe Lytton knew about these guys long before Admiral Byrd discovered them, and they're the very same beings. Maybe. Entirely possible. Uh, it's something else. Well, as we know, Admiral Byrd came back and lived uh, out the rest of his life, as, as evidenced in his diary. His commanding officer, however, James Forrestal, remember James Forrestal from a few minutes ago? <laughs> he, uh, he didn't do very well. He was an abductee, and of course now he knew totally about uh, what we could call it the alien problem, the subterranean problem, the Aryan whatever you're going to call it, he knew about it and he was interested in everybody knowing about it. So he, uh, James Forstall, would go to various Congress members and start talking about, you know, disclosing what he knew to try to get it out to the public. Well, that wasn't okay with President Truman. President Truman, who was totally controlled by the cabal and one of their members, uh, wanted to keep this secret for whatever reason, that's probably some kind of nefarious reason, I would think, but for whatever reason. So uh, Truman fired, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Forrestal. Didn't he gaslight him, too? Yeah, exactly. They did. Uh, they gaslighted him, and they had him committed to Bethesda Naval Hospital, and he was there for a while, and then all of a sudden, he tied his neck to a bed sheet, jumped out the window, and committed suicide. Yeah, he was right. He was probably suicided. I would think so. Yeah. Now, now you may, the tale that we have just told you is multifaceted and wondrous and certainly would be relevant to anybody looking into UFOs, World War II, uh, spirit, spiritism as it regards to uh, politics. This, this is fascinating stuff. Right up our alley, isn't it? Right up our alley, but you may wonder why people don't know about this. Oh, this is top secret stuff. It's top secret stuff, and our favorite family, the Rockefeller family, right after the war, uh, doled out a bunch of money to write the comprehensive history of World War II. Uh, actually, they spent $139,000 on this thing, which was a chunk of cash.